Okay, my friends, welcome to Daily Power Parsha. This is our daily adventure in exploring the reading for each and every day. I say adventure because you never really know what, what we're going to uncover together. It's a lot of fun and hopefully uh, inspiring. All right, I'm going to share my screen. I'm ready to go over here with the reading. Reading number four for Wednesday, a.k.a. Camel Day. And uh, <laughs> Wednesday's reading will take us in a very interesting direction. Today's reading is, uh, okay, so the narrative, of course, is the 10 plagues intensifying and leading up to the breaking point for Pharaoh and the Egyptians and the Exodus. Well, we haven't reached that breaking point yet, but we're right there. We're right before plague number 10. And in this, in this reading, so we, we read before yesterday, we read before how God informs Moses about the upcoming 10th plague. And here Moses informs the Egyptians. Here Moses for, informs the Egyptians. One second, let me just double check something at the end of reading three. Um, yeah. Actually, who does Moses say this to? So God said to Moses, I'm going to bring one plague, one more plague. Afterwards, he'll let you go from here. <coughs> take, the, take the silver and gold. We talked about that. We talked about how the Jews and Moses were esteemed in the eyes of the Egyptians. Reading four, Moses speaks. Oh, here we go. When he stood before Pharaoh, this prophecy was said to him. So Rashi explains. Rashi explains what's going on. It's good to have Rashi. But basically, <laughs> Moses, it, the Torah is telling us what Moses said to Pharaoh when he was still standing before him, before Pharaoh kicked him out. Remember when Pharaoh kicked him out and said, I'll never, I'll never see you again. The next day, time I see you will be the day of your death. Basically, Pharaoh got upset at him. So we read in the context then, it was like uh, there was a negotiation about who should go, who should stay. Anyway, apparently, according to Rashi here, there was a conversation and a dialogue about plague number 10 as well, which may have precipitated the old get out. Anyway, here we go. Here Moses said, so said the Lord. At the dividing point of the night, we call that midnight. Right? At the middle point of the night, Kachatzot halayla. By the way, mid midnight is still called chatzot. That phrase, chatzot, is still used today for midnight and midday. By the way, <laughs> but it wouldn't be chatzot halayla. Be chatzot hayom. There's a mid. There's a midway point of the night and a midway point of the day. Just parenthetically, so in in the world, that's known as twelve. Right, twelve o'clock is midnight and twelve o'clock is noon. However, in Jewish law and practice. Midpoint is not exactly 12. I mean, it could be 12, but it could also not be 12. So I'll just give you an example. Today, let me look up my app, my Zamana map. Today, midday is 12.43. Yeah, that's midday. Midday is 12.43 and midnight is 12.43 .40, p.m. And midnight is 12.43 a.m. There you go. Why is it different? Why not 12? Why 1243? It's complicated. It has to do with how many hours of daylight there are, and then they're divided into 12 units. It's complicated. The point is that at the exact dividing point of the night is when God told Moses to tell Pharaoh, that's when plague number 10 is going to hit. Not like exactly midnight. So God says, I will go out into the midst of Egypt. This is Moses informing what God said. And every firstborn, here's the warning, every firstborn in the land of Egypt will die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits on, the, on his throne, to the firstborn of the slave woman who is behind the millstones, and every firstborn animal. What Moses tells Pharaoh is that this plague is going to hit on every level, in every segment of Egypt and Egyptian society. It's going to hit you, Pharaoh. It's going to hit your family. It's going to hit the, the slaves, the maidservants of Egypt, it's going to hit all the animals. It's going to hit everywhere. Verse 6, and there will be a great cry throughout the entire land of Egypt, 
such as there never has been and such as there shall never be again. There will be such panic, outcry, grief, loss, devastation, whatever it is, and all of the above. It will be so great, unprecedented, unrepeatable in history. That's how severe this plague is going to be. But to all of the to all the children of Israel, not one dog will wet its tongue against either man or beast. You know what that means? Not even a nothing will happen. Nothing, no plague, no death, no panic, no fear. Nothing is going to touch the Jewish quarter, the Jewish neighborhood of Goshen, to the point that not even any of the dogs will bark that that night of the plague. You know, dogs, when there's, this is coming from a non-dog owner, so consider me an expert. People are experts when they have no experience in fields, and I, I don't mind, you know, jumping in and, and throwing my hat in the ring as well. So when you have a dog, yeah, so if the dog is a little anxious or a little scared or a little, you know, upset, it makes noise, it's agitated, whatever, it might bark, yelp, howl, etc. Not Nothing, nothing going on. By the way, you know what night this was? The 15th of the month of Nisa, which is a full moon. Don't dogs howl at the full moon? I saw it in a movie. I'm kidding. The point is nothing is going to happen at the, in the Jewish neighborhood. It's going to be so calm, so like, like no, no, no stress, no, no fear, no loss, no grief. Not even the dogs are going to bark. And this is going to highlight the gulf and the distinction between the Egyptians and the children of Israel, in order that you shall know that the Lord will separate between the Egyptians and between Israel. Moses continues to Pharaoh, and all these servants of yours, he says to Pharaoh, all your servants will come down to me, will come to me, Moses, and prostrate themselves to me, saying, go out, you and all the people who are at your feet. Your people are going to come to me, saying, get out of here, and afterwards they will go out. Then he, Moses, exited from Pharaoh with burning anger. Burning anger. Who was angry? Was Moses angry? Was Pharaoh angry? Burning anger. So, you know, Rashi is a little bit vague. What's why burning anger? Why burning anger? Because Pharaoh had said to him, you shall no longer see my face. This is what precipitated when we read a few verses earlier, yesterday or the day before, when Pharaoh says, get out of here. Don't come back. This is the narrative. Again, we're a little bit chronologically, we're a little bit back, you know, moving things, cutting and cutting and pasting. This information from Moses to Pharaoh was actually told to Pharaoh, part of that previous conversation after the plague of darkness. There was a negotiation about who should go, who should stay. Moses says, no deal. Then Moses says, if you're not letting us go, this is going to happen. And then Anger. Pharaoh's angry. Maybe Moses is angry for getting kicked out. I'm not exactly sure. Someone was angry. Maybe both were angry. And that's what's going on. So now that conversation is done. And Pharaoh is still saying no, even with this warning. So the Lord said to Moses, don't worry. This is exactly per the script. Pharaoh will not heed you. He's not going to listen. He's not going to let you go in order to increase my miracles. In the land of Egypt, this will give me the opportunity to demonstrate my full might, my full glory, the full hand of God, so to speak, not literally, but the full measure of God's intervention. Um, okay, so clearly there's been a warning and a very severe warning, and that's in place. So Moses and Aaron had performed all these miracles before Pharaoh, miracles meaning the miracles and the plagues. But the Lord strengthened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the children of Israel out of his hand. Again, this is, evokes the question about free choice. The Lord strengthened Pharaoh's heart. Uh-oh, does that mean he didn't have free choice? He had free choice. Don't worry, he had free choice. He put himself in a position where, where it would be that much harder for him to renege. We, we got into this psychologically before, um, all that stuff. So we did that last week. You know, we, 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 we jumped into this topic. But the point is, that Pharaoh was not going to concede. He was not going to give in. He was not going to let them go until after the bitter end, until after the 10th plague. 
Okay, Exodus chapter 12, we begin. Actually, let's quickly toggle Rashi and see what we got here. Um, oh, interesting, interesting, interesting. I'm going to go back for a second. No. Okay, interesting Rashi to get us started. It, Rashi says that Moses told Pharaoh around midnight, Kachat Sod Halayla, the 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 chaf, the letter kaf as a as a um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? As a the grammatical term is is, is escaping me. A prefix, the kaf as a prefix means at or about. Not precisely midnight, but around about midnight. Why? So, right about midnight. Moses says about midnight, meaning near midnight, either before or after midnight. But he did not say bachatzot at midnight, lest Pharaoh's astrologers err and then say Moses is a liar. There was Moses. God had said, "Listen, so I'm just gonna, let me piece this together in my own words." God had said, "The tenth plague is going to come at precisely midnight." Moses did not say that to Pharaoh at midnight, but around midnight. Why? Even though I know it's translated here as at. But Rashi says that's not what it means. It means around. Why? Because he thought that if he would say at midnight, Pharaoh would say, I got my clocks. I got my astrologers. They're telling me the time. You know, those, those atomic clocks that are automatically synced. Yeah. He had his astro astrological clocks. They might be a second off. I'd be like, aha, Moses, you were wrong. It wasn't at midnight. So to, to, to account for user error, so he used the softer term around midnight, just so that Pharaoh shouldn't think that he got one up on God over here in any way. Even though God was going to do it at midnight, but if his clocks were wrong, so just to just to uh, prepare for that eventuality, or not eventuality, to, to stave off that concern, he said around. But the Holy One, blessed be he, who knows his times and his seconds, says, so at midnight, which means precisely. That's from the Talmud Brachot 3B. Um, here we go. Rashi asked an interesting question. So regarding the plague, it's going to kill also the firstborn of the slave woman. Rashi says, why were the sons of the slave women smitten? You would think that the Egyptians, the Egyptian slaves, the slave women were in the same boat as the Jews, right? Fellow slaves. The answer is because they too were enslaving the Israelites and were happy about their misfortune. The Medrash says that even the slave women of Egypt participated in the subjugation of the Israelites. So if we had a rank society, as the Egyptians did, it was Pharaoh, obviously, the free Egyptians. The non-free Egyptians, but the Israelites, the Jews, were underneath all of those. So even the slave women, who themselves were slaves, subjugated the Jews. hope that makes sense. Every firstborn animal, why were the animals punished? Because the Egyptians worshipped it. They worshipped the animals. And when God punishes any nation, he punishes its deity. Its deity, in this case, included the animals. The animals were punished. Again, Rashi kind of uh, preempts or addresses questions that you and I might have on this. Why the slave women's firstborn? Why the animal firstborn? Okay, we have answers. Um, all of it is coming from here, the Medrash. Okay, let's continue. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, when God says to Moses, Pharaoh will not, FYI, Pharaoh's not going to listen. He's not going to heed you. Why? In order to increase my miracles in the land of Egypt. Miracles is plural. We only have one plague left. So what's the plural? Understand the question. God says, uh, Pharaoh's not going to listen to you. So that, that will give me the opportunity to increase my miracles. What's miracles, plural? So one plague left. So Rashi explains, miracles denotes two, plural. So they are the plagues of the firstborn. Oh, I'm sorry. He says three. Oh, increase my miracle. So miracle is one. Miracles, plural, is two. Increase my miracles means more than two. That means three. So what were the three miracles left? 
Number one, plague of the firstborn. Number two, splitting of the Red Sea. And number three, the stirring of the Egyptians into the sea. Uh -huh. Well, I'm just going to say it in my own terms. So plague of the firstborn, the sea opening for the Jews, and the sea closing on the Egyptians. Those are your three miracles. Next. Um, um, okay, yeah, yeah, well, we're going to skip that Rashi. Let's go into chapter 12. Now we take a break from the action. We take a break from the plagues and talk about mitzvahs. Before the exodus, God wants to ensure that the Jewish people have what to take out with them, and not just the gold and silver that we spoke about yesterday, but they should have some spiritual merits, some spiritual zechuyot, spiritual... Luggage, not baggage. Baggage is a negative connotation. Spiritual luggage to take with them. They were slaves. They were enslaved for 210 years. It was bitter for decades and generations. And many Jews had begun perhaps looking toward some of the idols and idolatry and polytheism and paganism and all that sort of thing. So what? So God wants to ensure that the Jews have some credits under their belt. So God says to Moses the following. God spoke, the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying the following. I'm going to give you two mitzvahs. Mitzvah number one, Rosh Chodesh. And he says, God says, this month shall be to you the head of the months. Rosh Chadashim. To you it shall be the first of the months of the year. There's a few mitzvahs in this one verse. There's a few different mitzvot. Number one, it's Rosh Chodesh which means that the Jewish calendar is going to be run by the moon, by the lunar cycle. When the moon appears, that is Rosh Chodesh. When the moon gets full, that's the 15th. When the moon totally wanes to the point that it waxes is bigger. Wait, is wax bigger or wax is smaller? Waxes and wanes. Bigger, waxes, bigger, waxes bigger. bigger. When yeah, because wanes mean, wane means you're going down. Yes, yes, yes exactly. And by the way, Rabbi, I put a link in there. Dina Schusterman had an article on the front page this week at Chabad.org talking about the first mitzvah, Rosh Hodem. Yeah. Nice, beautiful, beautiful. Very okay, well, yeah, everyone should check that out. Also, I should mention tonight the Torah studies class is all about the mitzvah of observing the moon. So if, if you have a lunar curiosity, or you just want to study Torah, Torah studies tonight at 7.30, lunar curiosity, he said no one ever. But anyway, join us tonight at 7.30 for that. It's a great class. And check out the article from Dina. Um, thank you for sharing the link. Dina. It was on the homepage. There you go. This the homepage of the Torah. That's big. That's big. Yeah. So we have here in this verse, the midst of Rosh Chodesh, of the Jewish calendar assigning it by the lunar cycle. The first of the month is when the moon reappears, if you will, in the sky. But you also have here a mention that the month of Nisan, when the Exodus happens, is now henceforth the first of the months of the year. That's going to be it throughout and throughout Torah. This is, in fact, the case. Henceforth, whenever the Torah refers to the first month, it's, it's Nisan. And the seventh month is Tishrei, when Rosh Hashanah is. Yeah. Yes, you're hearing me correct. Rosh Hashanah, what we call the beginning of the Jewish year, the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, is the in, in biblical language is the first day of the seventh month, which I know makes no sense. Who starts a new year in the seventh month? I'm with you. We'll talk about that a little bit tonight. But there's two fir there's two firsts. There's the first month vis-a-vis -vis creation and the first month vis-a-vis -vis redemption, liberation, exodus, miracles. So you want to run normally, that's Tishrei, that's your Rosh Hashanah, that's your standard Rosh Hashanah. You want to go supernatural, that's right now. That's, I mean, not right now, but that's what we're talking about here. This is the first of the months of the year means this is now the first, the origin of supernatural, Nisa. So that is mitzvah number one. The Jews have now received the mitzvah of the Jewish calendar and the concept of a calendar, of a Jewish calendar. And, 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 and revolving around the moon. It's no surprise, the moon waxes and it wanes. It's big and it's small. You, it's bright and it disappears in the sky. Kind of like our story. It gets, it's great and it's not so great. 
we're, you know, we're accomplishing and then we're kind of quiet. This is true historically, collectively, and it's true individually. Every human being, every one of us has moments of waxing and has moments of waning, moments in which we're full, moments in which we shrink a little bit. And the message here is not to get too low with the lows because there's always a chance for redemption. There's always a chance to bounce back. Even if we're going through a difficult time, a rough time, there's always the opportunity to bounce back. That's where Rosh Chodesh is. That's why we celebrate. A new month is really the, the message of a new month is a new opportunity, right? We've been declining, declining, disappearing, getting small. We're back. We're back. The trend is reversed. We're back in a good place and we're getting stronger. That's the celebration of a new month. That's the message to the Jewish people. It's been bad for, for generations. Slaves in Egypt, almost swallowed up by another nation. But you know what? We're back. The boys and the girls are back again. Wasn't that a song? The boys are back again? Yes? I think I'm right then. Back in town. Back in town. Oh, back in town. Thank you. The boys are the back. The boys are back in town. Boys are back in town. That's the message of Rosh Chodesh. The boys are back in town. The Israelites, back in town. Yeshiva's right. open for business. Say it again. Yeshiva's open for business. Open for business. <laughs> open for business. <laughs> That's it. That's how I'm, I'm like, we're going to bounce with some swagger. We're going to shuckle with some swagger now. Right. All right. Let's go. Verse number three. So now we get the next mitzvah. So mitzvah number one is Rosh Chodesh, the Jewish calendar, the first, first month of the year, et cetera. Redemption, spirituality. Um, literally redemption story means a bad, a comeback story, right? Back in town. Let's back in business. Verse number three, we get our second mitzvah. Second mitzvah is the Paschal lamb. Here we go. God says to Moses, speak to the entire community of Israel. This was Rosh Chodesh. This was, God said to him this month, this month, he pointed to the moon. This is going to be how you tell when Rosh Chodesh is. It looks like this in the sky. That's what God told Moses. Now God continues the dialogue and tells Moses on Rosh Chodesh Nisan, in 10 days, this is what needs to happen on the 10th of this month, Nisan. Let each one take a lamb for each parental home, one lamb per household. Oh, that's literally what it says. A lamb for each household. So everyone needs to take a lamb. Yankel had a little lamb, right? It's a famous song. Right in Egypt, okay. But if the household is too small for a lamb, because the implication here is that the lamb is going to be eaten. But what if it's a small household and they're not going to be able to eat a whole lamb? So then he and his neighbor who is nearest to him shall take one according to the number of people. In other words, in other words, join up with a buddy, buddy system. If your household is too is does it will not be able to finish a lamb, then join up with a neighbor and split a lamb. Right. Split the order, split the lamb. Each one according to, to one's ability to eat, shall you be counted for the lamb. So just do some calculation. If the lamb has X number of ounces in the lamb, right? And each person eats X number of ounces or Y number of ounces. So figure out how many people you need to knock down a lamb. Done. You shall have, this is the first instance of shawarma in the Torah. Joking. You shall have shawarma lamb. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. You shall have a perfect male lamb in its first year. That's the lamb that you should bring for this uh, shindig that we're talking about. A perfect male lamb in its first year. You may take it either from the sheep or from the goats. So now we're getting into types of animals. So it could either be a male sheep or a male goat. All of that sounds like it would be considered the male lamb that we're looking at. And you shall keep it for inspection. Yeah, you know, like you have to get car emissions and you have to get your car inspected, home inspection, lamb, typical lamb inspection. So keep it for inspection. Joking about that. Keep it for inspection until the 14th day of this month. So God is telling Moses on day one of the month of Nisan that on day 10, the Jews should all gather an animal and keep it in their homes, tied to their bedposts, by the way. They like kept it in their home. For four days, from the 10th to the 14th, and then the entire congregation of the community of Israel shall slaughter it in the afternoon, afternoon of the 14th. Now, understand this. The afternoon of the 14th, this animal, this lamb, 
the Paschal lamb, the Pesach lamb, Passover lamb is sacrificed, is brought as a sacrifice. The meat is then prepared and cooked and roasted. And when do you eat it? That night, which is Seder night. That's how they used to do it back in the day, times of the temple. But this was year one. This is no temple. This was back in Egypt. This was going to be a home addition. They were to sacrifice their own animals in their, by their houses. I guess backyard, front yard, whatever. Not in the house, probably. That sounds a little too messy. And then prepare it. We'll see soon how to do that. And, um, and then eat it that night. Let's continue. Let's continue reading the details. And they shall take some of the blood of this lamb and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel. So right, left, top. And sorry, on the houses in which they will eat it. So paint the doorposts and the lintel red with the blood of the Paschal lamb. The, specifically the houses in which it's going to be eaten. And on this night, on this night, the night after the 14th, which in the Jewish calendar would be the night, the onset of the 15th, right? On that night, on this night, the 15th, they shall eat the flesh roasted over the fire. So it should be fire roasted, fire roast the lamb, and they should eat some of it. And they should also eat unleavened cakes, which we know as matzahs, literally it says matzot, matzahs, with bitter herbs, with the mar, they shall eat it. So yeah, the Seder, this is pretty much, this is where it comes from. That was the first Seder. I mean, this is even before the Exodus, they were supposed to have, we would call this the last Seder, supper, whatever. This was the last meal. Before uh, before freedom, they were supposed to have roasted lamb, matzah, and mar. That's it. Straight up, straight up biblical. This is not this is not rabbinic. It's a straight up Torah. Erev Exodus. Erev the Exodus. Yeah, you shall not eat it rare or boiled in water. God cares about how the animal is prepared, how the how the lamb is made. Don't eat it rare. Don't eat it boiled in water. No cooked lamb, except the only way to do it is roast it over fire, over the fire, its head with its leg and with its innards. Whole lamb roasted. And you shall not leave over any of it until morning. No leftovers, no leftovers, not leave over it until the morning. And whatever is left over until morning, you shall burn in fire. It's, it, becomes, it becomes not permissible to eat. So this sack, this Paschal lamb that you're that you're gathering, you're getting the animal on the tenth, keeping it in your home until the fourteenth. In the afternoon of the fourteenth, you slaughter it. Then you paint the door. Then you roast it. Then you eat it that night, the night of the fifteenth. Yeah, fire roasted lamb, Paschal lamb. D well done. Maybe not well done, but at least roasted in fire. Don't eat it that, eat it that, not don't, eat it, yes, eat it that night. If you can't finish it, invite some friends over, invite a neighbor over. Whatever's left, if you have any leftovers, it can no longer be subsequently consumed. It can't even be thrown out. It's holy. It's a sacrifice. Sacrificial meat. It has the status of a sacrifice. So what's the only eight, so what's the only advice? You got to burn in fire. Whatever you don't eat by the morning has to be burned in fire. And this is how you shall eat it. This is how you have that meal on the 15th, the night of the 15th. Your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Don't kick back in your house and eat the Paschal lamb, the situation. Don't eat this food with your uh, shoes off, you know, just re relaxing. Be ready to bounce. Why? Because we're after this meal, it's go time. This is the last meal in Egypt. Then Exodus. Exodus happens right after this meal. So eat it as you're eating this meal. Gird your loins, put your shoes on, and have your walking staff in your hand ready to go. In other words, pack your bags. That's kind of what it means, right? Euphemistically or colloquially. It's like pack your bags. We're busting out of Dodge. And you shall eat it in haste. Eat it in haste. No dilly-dallying, right? Eat it quickly. It is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord. I'm pretty sure this is the first time that the word Passover appears in Torah. And it refers to, of course, this, this moment, this, uh, this, this, uh, this, this exodus. Pesach Hashem, it is a Passover sacrifice to God. Let's continue. 
God says, I will pass through the land of Egypt on this night. Back, back to the plague. Back to the plague. We talked about the mitzvahs. Mitzvah number one is Rosh Chodesh. Mitzvah number two is the Paschal Lamb. Sacrifice, blood, eating, roasting it, eating it, etc. God says, on that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt and I will smite every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And upon all the gods of Egypt, I will wreak judgments. I, the Lord. And the blood from the Paschal Lamb, the blood will be for you a sign upon the houses where you will be. And I will see the blood, says God. I will see the blood and skip over you. And there will be no plague to destroy you when I smite the people of the land of Egypt. So as they're being smited, you guys are going to be fine. But what's the sign for the angel of death? You know, you could have thought that maybe the angel of death gets um, gets like a list of addresses. You know, like don't, don't, don't head to these addresses. No, angel of death has no time reading addresses. Just put the blood on the doorpost. Then I know it's a Jewish home, done. You know, we have that today, still till, till this day. We have a sign on our doorpost. You know what it's called? What's it called? Mezuzah. Mezuzah. Yeah. Hey, maybe it's not blood, but it's a mezuzah. It demarcates. This is a Jewish home. Herein lies a Jewish home. It's a very special thing. It's a very special thing to have mezuzah everywhere, but especially on the front door because it announces. It announces with pride, this is it. Also, in case uh, you know somebody needs to skip over a house or two, there's a good sign as well. All right, go elsewhere. Let's get back inside to our narrative. And this day, listen to this, this day, the day of the Exodus, shall be for you as a, as a memorial. Memorial means as a commemoration, as an annual commemoration. And you shall celebrate it as a festival for the Lord. It's a holiday throughout your generations till this day. 3,333 years later, we are still celebrating this event. So throughout your generations, you shall celebrate it as an everlasting statute. God says, here's what you need to know about the upcoming Exodus. Number one. Rosh Chodesh, get your calendar ready. Number two, get your lamb. Number three, at the appointed time, sacrifice your lamb, prepare the food, eat it that night, don't leave it over till morning, paint your doorpost red. Number whatever we're up to, now number whatever step, is on that night, angel of death is going to be hovering everywhere. Next step, paint your, as I said before, paint your doorpost and lintel red with the blood, so that they'll be passed over. Last point, commemorate this day. This is going to be big. Commemorate this day as an everlasting statute of a holiday, and we call that Passover. For seven days, how do we celebrate this holiday? For seven days, you shall eat unleavened cakes. Unleavened cakes, matzah. I don't know why they don't just say matzah. Everyone knows what matzah is. Everyone in Publix, on Ponce, even a very sparing a uh, very um, slender Jewish, uh, sorry, kosher section will have matzah. It's going to have matzah. Everyone knows matzah. They're still going with unleavened cakes as if we don't know what matzah is. Anyway, for seven days, you shall eat matzah. But on the preceding day, in other words, before, this is talking about how, the Everland, how, how we commemorate Passover. This is not what they were supposed to do in Egypt. This is what we are to do every year on an annual basis as we're celebrating the anniversary of the Exodus. For seven days, you shall eat matzah, but on the preceding day, you shall clear away all leaven from your houses. Already Erev Passover, Erev Pesach, we are not to have any leaven, any chametz, no chametz in the house. Clear away all leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leaven on, on the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel, that person. That soul is being compromised, compromising their connection, their, their Jewish connection. 
because of how central the Passover experience and commemoration is to the Jewish identity. That's kind of what he's saying. So what's the point? The point is that it's a matzah only holiday and 11 has to be gone already a day before the holiday starts, which is what our custom is. In fact, we burn whatever remaining chametz we have in our possession, we burn it on the morning of our Passover so that it's done the day before. So if, for example, if the Seder is a Monday night, Monday night Seder, So then what you would do is Monday morning would be the burning of the chametz, getting rid of clearing away, whether that means removing or burning all leaven from the house. Let's continue on the first day of Passover. There shall be a holy con convocation. In other words, it's a, day, it's a holiday, which means, as we'll see soon, no work. It's a holy convocation. On the seventh day also, you shall have a hol holy convocation, which means no work may be performed on them. But what is eaten by any soul that alone may be performed for you. So the Torah specifies, God specifies that no work is to be done on the first and last days of Passover. In the middle days, you can work, but not the first, not the last. In the diaspora, i.e., outside of Israel, we have two first days and two last days. So it's two and two, and those days are non work days. The middle days are work days. I hope that's clear. So, and it's all, all this is from the Torah. First day, is holy convocation, last day, holy convocation. Holy convocation means no work may be performed. Except, except the only work that you're allowed to do on, on, on a Yom Tif is anything pertaining to eating. So you can cook, you can cook food on Yom Tif, not on Shabbos, but on a holiday, on Passover, you can cook. There you go. Um, that's what it means, no work may be performed except what is eaten by any soul. In other words, except for anything involving food, eating, food prep, etc. Now, take a look. Let's continue. And you shall watch over the unleavened cakes. Watch over the unleavened cakes. That, that means not just eat the matzah, but you should guard the matzah. Guard the matzah. You know what that means? Be very careful that your matzah doesn't become chame, it doesn't become leaven. This is why we have a phrase, a term called, and an item, a product called shmura matzah. You ever heard that expression, shmura matzah? Matzah is matzah. What's shmura matzah? Shmura matzah means expensive matzah. I'm kidding. Shmura matzah means guarded or watched matzah. Where does it come from? Ushmartem et hamatzot. Ushmartem, shmura. You should watch the matzahs. Now, what does that mean? You're watching the matzahs. It means... Wow. On the most extreme, on the highest level, it means literally, I'm going to stop sharing so I can like see you all in full color. So what it, full size. So what it means is that the wheat, listen to this, the wheat is watched in the field to make sure no water comes in contact with it. From the moment the wheat is cut, no water is, is to fall on that wheat. And then when it's transported, it's not just when it's made into flour that you don't want it to be mixed into water and ferment for too long and blah, blah, blah. Even before it's made into flour, the wheat kernels themselves, no water is to touch the wheat. That's what shmura matzah really is. Shmura matzah means you guard the matzahs. What else are you guarding? What are you guarding? Guarding the box? No one eat it? I like this stuff. What are you guarding? Guard and you shall watch over the matzahs. This is the source of shmura matzah, which is the best type. Now, shmura matzah will always be handmade. So here's a plug, an early Passover plug. In addition to whatever matzahs you might eat out of convenience or budgetary considerations, make sure to also have at least a box of the good stuff. When I say the good stuff, I mean, you know, the gelti stuff, the shmura matzah. It's a little pricey, but it's worth it. Um, it's worth it because it's doing the mitzvah in the ideal fashion because the Torah says, ushmartem et matzah. Today's Torah reading, it literally says, Watch over your matzah. And so to buy matzah that was watched is the ideal with the mitzvah. Why, why watch over the unleavened cakes? And what's the deal? Why all of this? The reason is for on this day, from this very day, I have taken your legions, right? Your soldiers, the, the army of Hashem, I've taken you guys out of the land of Egypt and you shall observe this day throughout your generations. This is an everlasting holiday. We do it till today. I don't need to tell you this. Right? We all know this. 
as an everlasting statute. It's a chok, or chukat olam, an everlasting statute, which means statute means the type of mitzvah that we don't fully understand, even though we understand that you know, to commemorate a liberation of a whole people of a two or three million people, that's a big deal to celebrate. But the details, a paschal lamb has to be roasted, you know, eaten that night, you know, no leftovers, leftovers need to be burned, make matzah, don't become leaven, get rid of all the leaven stuff, watch over your matzah, all of this stuff are chukim, statutes. Well, God said, so we're doing it. Do we understand all the details? Not really. I mean, there are explanations given, but is it the full explanation? Probably not, but it's a statute. Let's continue. And this is the everlasting statute. And the Torah, you know, details it right here. In the first month, which I told you is Nisan, on the 14th day of the month, in the evening. So it's the 14th and the evening, which means the evening of the 15th, really. It's the fourth, it's after day 14. The next evening, well, that's already the 15th, which is the Seder. So on that night, you shall eat unleavened cakes until seven days, until the 21st day of the month in the evening. So again, day 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, that is seven days. So you start from the onset of, the, of day 15, which is the evening after the 14th. You start then and you end seven full days later at the end of the 21st day of the month. For seven days, the Torah reiterates, this is a, re a repeat. Of course, every time it repeats it, it adds a little wrinkle and laws are derived. But again, generally speaking, it's a repeat. For seven days, leavening, no forms of leaven or leavening shall be found, shall not, the leavening shall not be found in your houses. For whoever eats leavening, that soul shall be cut off from the, from the community of Israel, both among the strangers and the native born of the land. So clearly strong warnings against not eating chametz on Passover. You shall not eat any leavening throughout all your dwellings. You shall eat unleavened cakes. So no leavening, no chametz, only unleavened, unleavened cakes, which are matzot. All right, that is the reading. What an action-packed reading. I do have some reflections. Um, we, I'm sure we have a lot of Rashi's over here. So let's... Um, Okay, let's take a look at this. Give me a second. Yeah. When God says, this month shall be the head of the months, or Shkodesh, God showed, Rosh says, God showed him the moon in its renewal. God showed him what it looks like when it's not the end of the month, but the beginning of the next month. Like, this is when it bounces back. This is what it's supposed to look like. God showed it to him. Nevertheless, all right, so that's, this, that's, the, that's the understanding that this is Rosh Chodesh. The symbol meaning, Rashi says, is that this is the first of the month of the year. So here is the second month, so it's the third month, etc. Now Moses found difficulty, next Rashi, Moses found difficulty determining the precise moment of the renewal of the moon, in what size it should appear before it is fit for sanctification. Was, how big should the, does the moon need to be to call it Rosh Chodesh? A tiny speck? or a little bit of a crescent. So God showed him, God showed Moses with his finger, the moon, God pointed, not literally, but God pointed out the moon in the sky at that point and said to him, you must see a moon like this and sanctify the month. In other words, what when they were having the shmuz, that was when it was the precise time of Rosh Chodesh. So God says, Moses, you're struggling with what it's supposed to look like. Just look up. Here you go. That's what it's supposed to look like. When it, when it looks like this, that's Rosh Chodesh. So how did he show it to him? Rashi asked, didn't God speak to him only by day? Right? So how did God, So rather, it was just before sunset, the chapter was said to him, and he showed him the moon when it became dark. So God spoke to him before sunset, because God only spoke to Moses during the day. Uh, apparently, that's what it seems like. And... Um, pointed it out in whatever way at night. Okay, let's take a look. I'm looking for more Rashis. Um,
Okay. Um, let's do this Rashi. This looks like a very interesting Rashi. You shall keep the lamb for inspection, four days for inspection until it's brought. This is an expression of inspection that the animal requires an inspection for a blemish four days before it's slaughtered. Now, why was this designated animal to be take animal to be taken four days before it's slaughtered? Something not required in the Passover sacrifice for later generations. In later generations, they didn't have to take the Paschal lamb four days earlier, put it into their house, and then bring it to the temple. They just got a lamb, went to the temple on the right day. Boom, bada beam, bada boom. So Ramasya ben Kharish said as following: Behold, God says, and I passed by you and saw you, and behold, your time was the time of love. The time for the fulfillment of the oath that is worth to Abraham that I would redeem his children had arrived. So God emerges here with love. But the children of Israel, as I mentioned before, the children of Israel had no commandments in their hands. That means no mitzvahs. They had no mitzvahs with which to occupy themselves in order that they be redeemed, as it says, but you were naked and bare. That means like naked and bare means that you just you're bereft, not physically, but bereft of mitzvahs, of good deeds. So he gave them two mitzvahs. This, I said before, but you should see it in Rashi. He gave them two mitzvahs, the blood of the Passover offering and the blood of circumcision. Oh, two different ones. I'm sorry. I said Rosh Chodesh. But here we have two different ones regarding blood, the Passover lamb, which we talked about. And now we have a new one, the blood of circumcision. They circumcised themselves on that night. Who knew? There you go, right here. They circumcised themselves that night, the night of the Exodus, before they left, as it is said, down trod him with your blood, and his was we'll started with the two types of blood. God states also, you too, with the blood, with the blood of your covenant, I have freed your prisoners from a pit in which there was no water. Okay, so we're going to skip the rest. The point is that there was also Brit Mila, also circumcision, that took place then at that night. Okay, let's go. Sorry, let's do shall slaughter it for generations. The Passover comes, they shall slaughter the, the animal. Now, do they all slaughter it? That was say. So the people should slaughter it. The people don't do the slaughter, and the priests do the slaughter. And rather, from here we can deduce that a person's agent is like himself. How do you know the power of agency in Torah? Listen to this. How do we know the power of agency in Torah? That if you have a mitzvah, you can actually sometimes, not all mitzvahs, but some mitzvahs, you can actually be absolved. Well, you it, your fulfillment can happen through someone else doing it for you. For example, have you ever heard Kiddush and you say Amen and then you drink it, right? So somebody is kind of taking care of the Kiddush or Havdalah or um, there are other forms of this where Shluchay Shal Adam Kamaisa, a person's agent is like himself or herself in the sense that they can do it on your behalf and it's like you've done it. Not all, not all, you know, uh, like eating the Paschal lamb, you have to eat it. But this, right, no one can eat for you. No one ever said, oh, I don't need lunch. Someone else ate for me. Said no, literally no one ever, right? So eating is a personal thing. There are certain things that are, that are definitely you. But when it comes to slaughtering the sacrifice, someone does it on your behalf. Maybe you have an obligation to have it slaughtered, but not to do the actual slaughter. By the way, interestingly enough, you should know another area of Jewish law where agency is acceptable is when it comes to marriage. Listen to this. If you, if, let's say a guy gives another guy a ring and says, go to this woman and ask her on my behalf if, she'll, if she consents to marriage, and then she says yes, and then you give her the ring and you say, Harry, I'm a Kodesh, you say the betrothal statement. At that point, the kidu, if she accepts it, and as long as she's on board with this, then the Kedushin, the betrothal, is effectuated through an agent. Listen to this. You with me now? Not if the agent says, "I want to marry you." Then you know, then hey, he took a good idea and ran with it. I mean, he apparently sh she's a good person to marry. You tell an agent, he's like, "I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this for me." Well, that complicates things. But let's say he sticks to the plan and he says, "On behalf of so and so, they would like to betroth you." And so here's the ring. Here's the statement. Do you accept? And she does. Boom, betroth. So in halacha, there's lots of conversation about this. An agent is like the other person. It's almost like when the agent gives the ring, it's like the one who sent them is giving the ring or putting it on her finger. It's only, it's, that's how tight knit that relationship is between um, agent and appointee of the agent.
All right. But anyway, we learned that over here. We learned one of the places, one of the sources for deriving the power of agency is from the story of the Paschal Lamb. The Torah says, you shall slaughter. You shall slaughter. I should slaughter. I don't know how to slaughter. What? I can show up to the temple and start slaughtering? It's not happening. Right? No, you shall slaughter through an age. Let's continue. Um, uh, take some of the blood. Rabbi, I have a question yes. on, on yes. Rashi 17. Rashi 17. Okay, that's further. Okay, yeah. The unleavened cakes? Yes. So <clears throat> the first Rashi says, do not read the unleavened cakes, but instead consider the unleavened cakes means the commandments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. No, it's not to the exception of the simple meaning. This is a drash. This right. is like, uh, um, you know, like a deeper teaching saying, it's not only Ushmartem as matzos, watch the matzah, it's Ushmartem as mitzvahs. In the Hebrew, you can read it both ways. But I mean, it, my question is, um, was it literally that they didn't have time for it to leaven, or was it a commandment not to let it leaven? Commandment. It was a commandment. So it wasn't, we always say they didn't have time, you know. It was fake, a commandment. Fake what? news. Fake news, right. No, no, no. It's, I'm sorry. It, it's, in, it's, in the, it's in the Haggadah. It can't be fake news. But it's the questions asked in many sources, including in Hasidic sources. The Alter Rebbe famously asked this. He says, one second. We, on the night of the Seder, we say matzah, zoo. This matzah that we're eating is why? Because the dough didn't have a chance to rise before they left. It makes it sound like it's like it's this this, uh, this great accident. Wasn't right. it an accident? It was God said, eat unleavened cakes. Don't eat chametz. So it says in Chassidus and Kabbalah that there's two levels of matzah. There's pre-midnight. Midnight was when the exodus happened, right? There's pre-midnight matzah, which was by design. And then there's the post-midnight matzah that was a happy accident. Right? There's two, di two different matzahs. So before, before midnight, they indeed intentionally bake matzah. But after midnight, it's another level of matzah. Even if they wanted to bake bread, they couldn't have baked bread because they were on the run. So this represents, if we're getting into it, we might as well get into it all the way, ego and humility. So there's a, there's a before midnight means that I'm working on myself to intentionally right, limit my ego. That's baking matzah intentionally means that I intentionally work on myself to become a little bit more humble. But then post midnight is where even if you wanted to have ego, you couldn't because something amazing just happened that took your breath away and you are absolutely floored and you are humbled. You with me? So when, when an exodus happens, no one could say, oh, look what I did. Look what we did. I'm free. See you later, Moses, right? Uh, sorry. Pharaoh, see you later, Pharaoh. Like, don't let the door. No, that's us. Um, whatever, right? See you later, bro. No one could walk with such arrogance and ego, having just experienced the most incredible revelation and freedom and exodus of all time. So, again, simply spoken, there's things in our spiritual service that we have to work for, and then sometimes we're gifted and experience. Right. So there's the humility that is born of effort and the humility that's born of a life altering event. And that's pre midnight matzah and post midnight matzah. So on the night of the Seder, we say that the matzah that we're eating today is not only limited to our efforts, it's the one born of divine revelation because we've, we, our post divine revelation, we're post Exodus. We today are post Exodus and post Sinai and post every day studying Torah. So we're post revelation. So our humility doesn't have to be manufactured, it can be experienced on that higher level if we tune into it. Not easy. Ari, yes. uh, on that line, there's a Rashi and I have a note <laughs> here. It says Rabbi Yehoshia uh, says, Do not read the word only as matzahs but rather as mitzvot. Right. He says, just as people do not allow the matzahs to become leavened, so should they not allow the commandments to become leavened. 
Right. Um, rather, if the opportunity to fulfill a commandment comes to your hand, do it immediately. Right. And the note I have says matzahs and mitzvahs are spelled with the same letters. Correct. Uh, but are right. vowelized differently. And so the Torah said, you shall guard the matzahs rather than the more precise, you shall guard the dough. Yet it is, it is the dough which must be guarded before it has become a matzah. This implies a message which can only be conveyed through the use of the word matzah. Namely, you shall guard the mitzvot. Exactly. Notice he's interchanging matzah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, matzahs and mitzvot. Exactly. That, that's yeah. that's uh, powerful. Leket by here, what, what is that? What is leket by here? L e k e t b a h i r. I'm not sure. I'm not okay, sure. Okay, yeah. Okay. Good. 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 Joy, jump in. Okay, so this is a comment by Joy. <laughs> also, also, we like those. Uh, we like those. Yeah, we left. We are leaving the uneaten Paschal lamb, and we are leaving the unrised bread, and only taking the leavened bread because. We have to leave certain things in Egypt that are Egypt so that we can go and be free to worship. I love it. And it's sacrifice. almost, I love, I love what you're saying. It's almost like whatever we prepared before is still going to be tied into the slavery experience. We have to take almost a new batch of matzah that can't rise even if we wanted to because we're turning over a new leaf. That's what you're saying. I love it. Sure, you got to write this stuff down. <laughs> I know we have it recorded, but you got This is good stuff. This is good stuff. Everyone, I love. I love the contributions. All right, I'm looking at the time now. I realize it's really late, so let's close it for uh, here. Uh, tomorrow, what I want to do is um, I want to pick up some of the pieces from because I have another one or two insights that I want to share about this that we just read, and we're going to continue with the narrative about how it all played out. Tomorrow's reading is actually a little bit smaller. So we can we we can do more insights on what we just read now, and then we'll do the new stuff tomorrow, and we're we're right on track. I'm just checking up everything. We're good. All right, it's great to see everybody. Don't forget tonight. Quick announcement tonight: Torah study, seven thirty. If you can make it, whether in person or online, either way, it's going to be an amazing class, all about Rosh Chodesh and a specific wrinkle in the logistics of Rosh Chodesh. You don't want to miss it. I don't want to say more, but join me tonight for. Um, yeah, for a great class on Rosh Chodesh. Okay, we'll see you all soon. Thank um, you. All right, take care. Let's go. Have a wonderful day, everybody.